welcome to Dive into Reiki podcast. I'm Natalie J, your host, and I'm super excited today to introduce my new guest. And I'm so, so grateful she said yes. Uh, I'm introducing Pamela Miles. She's an internationally renowned Reiki master and the foremost pioneer introducing Reiki practice to conventional medicine. She's collaborated with academic medical centers such as Harvard and Yale, and has been featured on the Dr. Oz Show, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox, The Atlantic, US News, World Report, New York Magazine, and keep on naming all those amazing media. And Pamela is also the author on award-winning Reiki, A Comprehensive Guide. Welcome, Pamela. Thank you so, so much for joining me today. Oh, Natalie, thank you for inviting me. I've really been looking forward to it. It was easy to say yes. <laughs> Thank you. And as I mentioned when we talked last time, I'm really grateful. When I was really lost, I learned like Western Reiki and it was a very woo-woo kind. I really appreciate going to your clinic and, and just finding my way through Reiki. So I'm really grateful and will always wait for that. That wonderful oh, team. Well, clinic. I always enjoyed having you there. And I just want to clarify the term Western Reiki because yeah. I practice Western Reiki. Yeah. Some people call Western Reiki and um, and it's, you know, it's not all woo. I mean, my practice is not new agey at all. I, all of my Reiki masters were either trained by Hawaii or Takata or their Reiki masters were trained by Hawaii or Takata. So I learned the practice as Takata taught it before Americans started, um, you know, making changes to it, which were mostly add-ons. Uh, although they tried to make some things simpler, like you don't have to practice. <laughs> which to me was the most fun part of it. It was actually practicing. Um, so, so I practice Takata Reiki. And I, I love I, that clarification because as, and all Reiki is not the same and you were mentioning that. So we'd love to hear a little bit about that, your uh, origin story, because you're pretty unique compared to us. You actually had a spiritual practice for years before you met Reiki. So we'd love to hear a little about it. That's so sweet for you to say I'm unique <laughs> instead of odd. <laughs> well, I celebrate that. Yeah, I like that spin on it, Natalie. So, um, yeah, by the time I came to Reiki practice in 1986, I already had been a student of meditation and yoga for almost 25 years, and I was a meditation teacher. I'd lived in India in a monastery for a couple of years, you know, doing really intensive spiritual practices, um, very serious practice. And um, I was also a professional healer. You know, I, I worked with people one-on-one -on -one doing what might now be called mind-body medicine, but back there it was just odd. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, unique is the word I'm going to stick with here. And um, the advantage that that gave me was that I already had daily spiritual practice. You know, I, I understood that it's not enough to learn a practice. You know, you learn a practice so that you can practice and that the, the class or the training that teaches you the practice, the teacher that teaches you the practice, you know, that's so special. And you have uh, at least regard, if not reverence for that connection. But ultimately, if you don't practice, you know, you're just tossing it out the window. So that the, the to use marketing language, the practice is how you get that return on your investment. You know, that's how you get your your money's worth from your training. Um, and it's always seemed odd to me that that people finish one class and they want to right away go to another class and get another, you know, certificate or whatever they get and go to another class. And um, for me, I just couldn't wait to practice. You know, I remember those early days when I first learned to practice like, I just couldn't wait till I had some time alone. You know, I, I always did my 
my daily self-practice, my full protocol practice first thing in the morning before I was out of bed. But then during the day, I also wanted to practice. And, and you know, Natalie, what if we took a few minutes right now and practiced? Of course, let's yeah, do that. I would love to do that. I always Perfect. enjoy practicing with others. And for those of you who are with us live, and for those of you who will be joining us with the recording, please take this time and practice. It will be short, but you will get a significant benefit from actually practicing. This is illustrating what I've been talking about. And we'll do a very simple, brief practice. This isn't a classical practice. Just I put my hands to the crown of my head, my chest, and then my abdomen when I lead an abbreviated practice like this and we won't hold the placements for very long but just close your eyes if you can and be as comfortable as you can be wherever you are and bring your hands to the crown of your head either by lifting them or you can rest your elbows on your desk or your knees or if you can't do that, bring your hands to your heart. And all I suggest is that you leave your hands there until I mentioned that I'm going to be moving my hands. Just looking at my timer here. And take this time to just be with your practice. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to make anything happen. Just enjoy the experience of your Reiki hands resting lightly on your body. And keeping your eyes closed, bring your hands to your chest.
move your hands to your abdomen. Keeping your eyes closed, you can let your hands relax to your lap or wherever they're comfortable. And take a moment to simply notice how you're feeling. Notice any small change in the way you feel. From when we started practicing just a few minutes ago. What's different now? What would you like to continue to take with you? And then let the state that you're in now expand to encompass your physical body. Even though we practice just briefly, sometimes we drop deeply inside very quickly. So it's always good to check in and make sure that you're aware of your body before you let your eyes gently open. But bring the state with you. Don't leave it. Don't leave it behind. Bring the gifts of your practice with you into your body, into the rest of your day. So that's the practice that I love so much and that I am always happy to do and to share. And compared to the effort that was involved in the other spiritual practices I had, you know, this was very accessible. And you know, it was kind of fast and easy and fast and easy really aren't um, usually values of mine. But at the time that I ex experienced Reiki practice from a friend who had just taken the first degree class, I had a five-year-old and I was in um, early in my second pregnancy. So I like to have spiritual practice every day. I just don't go a day without it. It's easier for me to fast or lose sleep. But I also remembered what it was like, you know, when you give birth and in those early days, weeks, months, depending upon your baby. Yeah. So I was wondering oh, how I was going to manage this. And then I had a an experience of, Reiki from my friend and you know I very quickly started to have the same inner experience and and sensations 
that I were very familiar to me because of all of my experience with spiritual practice, you know, both at home and when on retreat and such. So nothing that I experienced during my Reiki treatment was new to me other than the practice itself. This was a new way of becoming deeply indrawn and becoming more aware of, of my subtle being, my timelessness and, and like that. So that gave me a very, very different perspective on the practice from the beginning. I could see this was a spiritual practice. And of course we, you know, we've come to know that, but that it wasn't presented to me in that way or understood in the US in quite that way with that language. I think actually, from what I know that Hawaii Otakata did have that understanding, but she didn't put that language to it. And I'm sure she had very good reasons. You know, we all live in different times and, and we have to be ourselves of our time and carry the integrity of the practice. At least that's been a value for me. No, absolutely. And, and as you said, we cannot really understand what it was to be heard, like, you know, at that time. And she did, like, she actually brought it here and spread it. But I think what you said, like, now we're coming to see it's a spiritual practice. It's still very new for many people watching uh, this podcast. So it's still seen very much as an energy healing modality, right? But it goes a lot deeper. And you mentioned something beautiful, bring into your body and extend it into your life. Right, so this is so much more than just, yes, you do your practice, you get a session, but the idea is to transform your life. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of the body and extending the practice? Well, the body is important because if we didn't have a body, we couldn't practice. <laughs> so you know, you know, like sometimes we go like Reiki angels, rainbows, right? We're going to the La La Land. You know, people can practice in whatever way is meaningful to them. Yeah. But the idea is not to disregard our body. You know, the, the purpose of all spiritual practice is to be present. And being present means being joyfully in our body, you know, because if we're not joyfully in our body, if we have discomfort with the body that we have, then we're not present. There's a part of us that's tied up with that, that's warring inside of us so to simply be present and um and there's confusion or a lack of um investigation into what is spirituality and what is spiritual practice in this culture you know many people have never thought of the difference between religion and spirituality and so, or, or metaphysics and spirituality, we see that even more around Reiki practice where people share their Reiki metaphysics. But if we ask people to see the world as we see it in order to be able to practice Reiki, I think we're cutting out a lot of people who would otherwise really be interested in the experience and the benefits that Reiki practice brings and you know the advantages it brings of, of being uniquely accessible. I mean, it's just the easiest spiritual practice that I've come across and I've been engaged in spiritual practices <laughs> since I was a kid. So there was a point at which I just said, more than 50 years because that's enough you know? <laughs> and spiritual practice is to be present to be able to live from our hearts you know to keep our minds in good health too i mean yeah. a, a good intellect is important to be able to discern um to, to be a critical thinker, you know, to, to know if, if you're engaged in anything around spirituality and you're not a critical thinker, you're going to fall for a lot of silly stuff and you're going to be disappointed, especially if you don't have a daily practice. Because there's so many disappointments in life, right? I mean, this is something 
we're experiencing very acutely now with the pandemic and how long it's going on because people didn't think it would go on so long. You know? <laughs> yeah. They weren't quite seeing that this is a game changer. This isn't yeah. a blip. You know, this is a game changer. And daily spiritual practice means that we step into our changes on a daily basis. So we keep ourselves spiritually poised, settled in our bodies. And when something comes at us, we've got the resilience, you know, we can roll with it, we can be creative, we can, we don't forget who we are, we don't forget our timelessness. You know, when we don't forget our practice, because our practice is the source of our resilience. I know I love that. And I, I really admire people going through this without a spiritual practice. Like it's been a lifesaver. And I'm changing the order a little bit of the question, but it's a great follow up uh, because you actually started with before the pandemic, it was declared pandemic, you started a global practice group. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I uh, had just come back. I had a few months with a lot of travel. I was in Europe and then I was in Mexico leading the um, Heart of Practice retreat. And um, then I was in Curacao and I was in Atlanta teaching and I came back to New York like the first of March, I think. And I could see what was happening, you know. And, um, and I knew that people were going to be very frightened and they were going to be isolated. You know, I could see that we were going to wind up in, in some kind of a lockdown and being frightened and being isolated is a devastating combination for your immune system. Either one of them compromises your immune function. And then those together can easily lead to depression, which further lessens people's immunity. So I was looking to see how can I support people in their self-practice and also give them a sense of community. And, and so since, you know, um, I'm kind of the queen of self-practice, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you, mentioned, you were the first person who mentioned self-practice to me. It's like, am I supposed to have a self-practice? I didn't even know about that. They didn't train me like that. Well, I hear that from many, many people that they've been through a class and either they were told to practice on themselves for 21 days or it just never was even discussed. Whereas in my trainings, that's the core. You yeah. know, you do a lot of self-practice. So... So I, I, on March 10th, I think was the first one, the day before the World Health Organization declared the global pandemic. And we practiced together and, you know, in, that was Tuesday at four. And then I added Saturday, like at 9 a.m. And uh, within, I don't know, six months or something, 25,000 people had registered and of course not everybody registered and came back you know but <clears throat> still it was something that clearly was speaking to people and the important idea for me was mixing care of self with community because everybody else is wanting to take care of other people you know and that's just more of maybe the thing that we need to change in this time to change is our proclivity for looking outwards, you know, like outwards for the Reiki energy as if it's something separate from us that we have to somehow, you know, trick into coming to us in, instead. Of <laughs> I love that description, but it's so true, right? Like, I'm like depleted of Reiki. Yes, I love that. Yeah, you yeah. know, or people say things like, I don't have my Reiki anymore, you know, well, do you practice? No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> if we think of it of Reiki practice instead of Reiki energy, it solves a lot of those problems. And also we always know what's available to us, that accessibility. 
and availability. So um, I, it, it's so heartwarming because I get many, many emails from people who say, you know, I've now been practicing every day for a month for six months, for three weeks, for, you know, whatever is a, a landmark for them, something they never thought they could do, and they notice the difference. So the idea of healing the planet by healing ourselves and making that connection with the quote that we hear so often from Mahatma Gandhi, you know, be the change you want to see not fixing. And to get back to the idea of energy healing and, and practice, you know, energy healing is more along the, the conventional medical fixing. Yes. You know, whereas spiritual practice is reminding ourselves of our intrinsic wholeness and wellness. And, and letting all the disparate parts of ourselves come to rest in our spiritual self, you know, where we feel our core and we remember <laughs> who we are. And then, you know, mind, body, spirit, emotions, intellect, you know, what, however you want to name these different parts of ourselves that may be gremlins. <laughs> I have a few gremlins myself, I guess. <laughs> They're all like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and they feel safe. And everybody behaves better when they feel safe, right? <laughs> you know? It's for me, like, and I think when I discussed that in your clinic, like for me, it really opened my heart. But the biggest thing was acceptance and compassion towards myself. But by changing myself, I'm a lot kinder to my family and my friends. So it's, as you say, like the change starts in, but it actually really affects people's life, literally. Like you lead by example. I love that. Because yeah, we want to place our hands on other people and change them. So we like them more, right? That was me. Right. And, <laughs> and I, I think a lot of people feel that way. And, and certainly I've had my moments too. Um, but compassion isn't for anyone. Compassion is a state. It's an attainment, you know, and when we're willing to sit with ourselves and practice with ourselves and we drop into our hearts, we experience the compassionate love that it is our true nature, you know, and so we feel it in ourselves because that's who we are first, but the way we are with other people is just a reflection of how we are with ourselves. You know, really? you ever notice that person who really like pisses you off? You know? <laughs> uh, if you're lucky, you'll catch yourself doing the thing that that person does that annoys you so much. It's, it's always just a reflection of how we feel about ourselves. So as we feel unconditional self-love, even for a moment, it's a crack in the confusion, you know, and then we just keep coming back to it and we build a habit. This is another part of consistent daily self practice is that we're building a habit, we're building neural pathways. It's not just a good idea, you know, we're actually making it easier for us to take refuge in our center, rather than refuge in our drama, you know, which only creates more suffering and so life isn't always going to be easy it, it certainly doesn't get easier when we start practicing but we are more equipped we're better equipped to be with the challenge because we feel safer feeling safe is a spiritual issue and a spiritual attainment and practice is the only way we can earn that experience and own it, you know, otherwise it's kind of like being on a diet where we're just 
having to say no, 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 you know, and we're not even sure that this is really going to work for us. But when we practice, especially practice self-reiki, we experience pretty quickly that something good is happening. You know, our systems start to settle and it happens on a discernible level in our nervous system. Wow. And, and that's, a, that's a big deal and a big difference. I, I love that you have the science background, the medical background, right? Because also for me, like not only that the first few months were amazing, but now that it's over, it's close to 15 years, I can feel it like, like it gets stronger and stronger. Like it never is like, it never gets boring. It gets just... And I still have my very bad days, but just knowing that I can come back. But I want to know, I love that part that my brain is actually changing. So like the pathways we're creating, I didn't know any of that. And it's going to use it as a segue because you actually are also very, you were the person bringing Reiki to mainstream healthcare, like or to the care. I don't know if mainstream healthcare is the right way to put it, but you were bringing it to healthcare and you did amazing work and part of it is that you have a very down-to-earth approach, but also, you know, the science behind it, like whatever science we can have, at least of the body, right? So how did you just come up one day and say, like, I need to bring this to healthcare and, and how difficult was it? No, I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> I never said that. And if I had said it, no one would have listened because I don't have a medical background, yeah. you know? I mean, I did... Um, original research uh, as an undergraduate um, when I was getting, yeah, I have a couple of undergraduate degrees. And so I've always had an interest and my mother is a nurse, my sister, my grandmother, you know, so medicine has always been part of my background. Yeah. But I think that what gave me a unique qualification and and really i kind of started medical reiki you know um, yeah. was this marriage of spiritual practice and a scientific intellect you know it is a very good description and combination yes and and a desire to serve because if i had i, I mean i the reason why i was invited to create the first hospital program was because I was doing um, community service at Gay Men's Health Crisis here in New York City, oh. offering um, Reiki training to, at that point, it was still all guys with HIV AIDS. And this was before the protease inhibitors and you know the drugs that have been developed that have really helped people be able to live with HIV AIDS. I mean, then it, it was really a death sentence and everybody knew it. And so I started teaching people to practice on themselves. And the doctors in infectious disease, that's what the AIDS specialists were called, uh, they noticed that whenever they had a patient who was doing better than expected was the phrase that I heard a lot. Um, that invariably they talked about Reiki practice and usually they were students of mine. You know? And so um, the department head at Beth Israel Medical Center, what was then Beth Israel Medical Center is now, I think Mount Sinai, Beth Israel, um, was a very forward thinking, interested in integrative medicine, um, understood that even if we couldn't cure a disease, we could at least still help people. So that's why I was uh, asked to come in and present. It was my first medical presentation. And, you know, my knees were knocking because I knew this was, it would be easy to lose this opportunity. I knew it would be easy to step in the wrong direction. But I just kept my mouth closed, uh, you know, and when I was asked a question, I didn't try to pontificate. Uh, I answered the question briefly because I know doctors are very busy. And I always tried to answer the question in a way that would make sense to them 
without compromising the reality of what I was offering, you know, that this, I've always spoken of Reiki as a spiritual practice, because by then I was a Reiki master. And I, for me that, you know, I took years to do that. Um, and, and so, you know, everything else came out of that, because in fact, there were a lot of people in conventional medicine who were very interested in what else could be done, you know, and at first it surprised me, but then when I thought about it, well, yeah, these people see so much suffering that they can't help. Even now that they can do more in terms of the fixing part, yeah. there's still a lot of, it's almost as if suffering itself is not a medical issue, again, like safety, it's a spiritual issue. So, you know, doctors may be able to help you with your pain, but suffering is a spiritual concern. I, I love the way you put it because you also give Reiki a place that feels very safe and useful in the healthcare environment, right? And not like, I don't know, like it can work together beautifully without being dangerous like you know sometimes we communicate Reiki in a way that could feel a little bit dangerous to doctors so I really love the way you put it yeah I mean that's such an important point that you're bringing up Natalie and, and is the communication piece and this you know I've always been I've been a writer since I was a kid so I've always been thinking about communicating um, not just what do I want to say but how can I say it it, you know, because it's not just writing as self-expression, but writing to communicate. <clears throat> and that made a big difference in um, being able to bridge cultures. And when it came to medical Reiki, you know, the practice itself is the same that I practice everywhere, but the culture is different. And so I was bridging spiritual practice culture with medical science culture, and also bridging lay culture with licensed professional culture. You know, so there were lots of, of places where <laughs> we could have made a wrong turn, you know, and, um, and I was on a pretty steep learning curve. I mean, I just kept my mouth shut and I listened. And then I had uh, my, my partner there, the staff person, uh, at the end of the day, he would always make time for me and I'd go in and I'd say, what does this mean? What is that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, and so it, it helps a lot. I find it makes a big difference if there's somebody in the hospital or the institution who has at least some experience of Reiki practice because they appreciate the value. You know? No, and... Yeah, I love some, you have said amazing thing. First of all, for them to experience the practice. Second, in your case, listening, right? Understanding them and then communicating clearly. I think that that is rare, like it's so precious, but it's, it's great tips for people to follow. Yeah, there's a difference between self-expression and communication. And if we want to communicate better, we have to be better listeners. And I find this is true, you know, in my personal relationships uh, with my one-on-one -on -one clients for comprehensive healing sessions and with students, like they'll tell you what they want to know if you listen. And I always keep in mind those wonderful words from Steve Jobs, you know, it's not the customer's job to know what they want. So realizing they're not going to use my language. I can't wait for them to use my language or my concepts. I have to hear their language and recognize what they're saying behind what they're saying. So if they ask, what is Reiki? You know, mostly they don't give a damn what Reiki is. <laughs> you know? I mean, most people just aren't that conceptually curious. Yeah. What they're asking is, can this help me? Or can this help somebody I love? You know, they've got some suffering that they're not able to address. And 
if we as the Reiki practitioners and especially Reiki professionals can be quiet enough and safe enough, they'll spill the beans. You know, they'll tell us what they, they want to know and then we can tell them what they're, they've been asking us even though they weren't using the words we would have used. <laughs> Thank you. That that is a great reminder, and and it's funny because at the end it's all about listening, holding the space, going back to the self, right? Like it's not trying to go and fix it and impose what we think is needed. So I really, really appreciate you putting it so simply because I'm a lot better at self-expression than communication as a creative writer. So that's why I appreciate so much when people can communicate clearly as well. So, and I wanted to, because you have achieved a lot, you have worked with a lot of universities and you have all these accomplishments. And yet at this moment, we finally say like, yay, we're almost in healthcare in a decent place. Now there are a lot of regulations that are coming that seems to be a little in danger in that progress. And I'm, I'm a Scorpio, so I always make things very dramatic, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, <laughs> that's part of the creative writer. But, you know, like after so much work and now you're actually a part of the group that is really uh, leading and trying to fight these regulations so that they're a little bit more fair to all of us with the licensing. I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I could more easily talk a lot about it, but I'll try <laughs> to talk a little bit about it because it's a very complex situation. Yeah. Um, and, and something that I feel very strongly about, you know, spiritual practices should not be legislated. And it doesn't make sense. Are they, is the government going to require a license to meditate or to pray? You know, Reiki is a spiritual practice. And, and, and then if you even think about the logistics, like, well, how would they do that? You know, I mean, that's a whole other thing, but it just, the fact that there are states that are looking to regulate and it's never just reiki practice it's um in massachusetts which is the current battleground um it seems to be all subtle practices all non-invasive practices that have been recognized as being safe non-invasive means safe and that's why there's no licensing for them you know, because licensing ostensibly is to protect the public. You don't want a surgeon who hasn't gone through medical school with a specialty at the end, you know, another seven years to become a surgeon, right? Because if a surgeon makes a mistake, there are horrible consequences. But um, as Reiki professionals, certainly we can hurt people but it's through our mishandling of another human being. It's not through the practice itself. And, yeah. and that's human nature. And that's not something that can be really controlled through regulation. So what I am in favor of, I mean, certainly because the Massachusetts legislature has bills uh, introduced, which if passed would mean immediately that all of these practices that the professionals would become illegal because they would have licensing. There's not even like a six month um, transition period um, if it's passed, you know, as it's written. Uh, so that's that's something that that's like the acute crisis, you know, we need wow. to address that. And there's a petition and I hope everybody will sign that petition and share it and really nag your friends to sign it as well and share it. But then bigger than that is how can we keep our practice available, accessible to the public, you know, like, we all have different Reiki practices and we all, I think, want the way we practice to be available to our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And if the government, and it would be at the state level because the states regulate medical practice, healthcare practices. So if the government takes control 
of licensing these practices, that means that there will be a board, some version of this, you know, this is what it comes down to, that there will be a small board, and we're talking about all these different practices, and somebody on that board, who probably is a friend of somebody in the legislature, knows something about Reiki practice, and that person would be responsible for deciding what the licensing would involve what what we're allowed to teach you know what's our curriculum how are we supposed to practice does it have to be off the body does it have to be on the body do we have the freedom to choose according to what we think is best and best for our our client so um the solution that i am working to further is, first of all, Reiki practitioners to get savvier about communicating. Because the as you mentioned so astutely before, the way a lot of Reiki practitioners speak about Reiki, it's very unguarded. Yes. You know? and, and for people who aren't of that mindset, it sounds scary. It sounds... Very imbalanced you know it sounds like something is taking them over it's confusing at best so for reiki practitioners to be more savvy in their communication because a lot of the problems that we're experiencing date back to the way that we've communicated you know just just kind of reckless and thoughtless and then reaching out to our state elected officials and um, you know calling their offices making an appointment you probably won't get to speak to the actual official doesn't matter you can speak to their gatekeeper this is their job and to be able to speak very succinctly you know my reiki practice is important to me um, i don't know how i could have gotten through my cancer treatment without my Reiki practice, you know, that the doctor certainly addressed cancer, but that's what helped me heal in a very profound way. End of story, <laughs> you know, just like people wanna make it big. No, big makes doctors and um, legislators who are conservative, no matter whether they're Republican or Democrat, they're conservative by nature, right? So when people speak big in an exaggerated way, it makes them nervous. It discredits us. So we want to be very sober and simple. Your little Reiki story, little, oh, how it, it helped you get your child to sleep at night. That's huge. But they need to hear from a lot of us. And they need to hear about Reiki practice in a way that's not scary and off-putting. No. And, and not going in there and saying, well, let me give you some Reiki. No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't do that. Yes, if, if we could do that, it probably would solve the problem. I was thinking if we'll bring them all to your clinic, like you know, the spa, the big JCC spa, I think they will change their mind, you know, after four hours, but yeah. So the only reason we ever talk about Reiki practice in a situation like that is to shorten the distance between where that person is now and when they're going to have their first Reiki experience. Because once they have an experience, the conversation changes. Yeah. But let's be realistic. Our elected officials are probably not going to have a Reiki experience. We need to equip them. We need to get their attention, first of all, and then equip them with some simple language and stories so that they see, oh, yeah, this is important to the people who have voted for me and will vote for me again. And it's also safe because, again, that distinction that you made of alleviating pain, fixing pain, and alleviating suffering, you know, 
I think but those stories actually feed that distinction that feels very clearly that shouldn't be regulated, right? Yes, and there is another option. It's called safe harbor law, and it's something that has uh, been conceptualized and, um, and actually passed in Minnesota, I think it was in 2005, that means that we can practice these non-invasive practices as we see fit, you know, within reasonable parameters, certainly, uh, and not interfering with any existing licensing, but um, specifying non-invasive practices as not needing to be regulated. So um, there's a woman, Diane Miller, and she has a new book called Health Freedom. And um, she has a, an organization helping people in different states to do this. And I hope that people will look into that. And I think you gave us some great tools because I mainly have no idea how to find this. I saw the webinar you had with Susan Mitchell and I was like, first of all, there was a part of diversity I didn't even understand was in danger, right? Because of the curriculum. So now you really give me tools like, okay, this is what I can do. And I'll be posting all those links as well beneath the podcast and on the podcast notes so people can actually reach those websites. And because I think on your website, I have all of that. So we can be more active because sometimes when I read, reach your representant, I don't know what to tell them. Now I know because, yeah. Yeah. And you want to know before you make the phone call, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because you never know, you could get right through to somebody. It could be a slow afternoon. So you want to know what you're going to say and rehearse it with friends, you know, like people can get together, Reiki practitioners who know each other can get together and and coach each other and it will help make us better reiki practitioners because we'll be better able to represent what we do to people who aren't like us in some ways but are like us in other ways that you know has his holiness says want to be happy and want to avoid suffering it's very simple the human condition which is the Reiki precepts, right? Sometimes we get very lost in Reiki. What is Reiki practice? But it's letting go of anger, worry, being grateful, and and find that space of compassion. You know, at the end, it's that simple, but so simple that it's very complicated to get there. You know, it's true. I tell my first degree students that the hardest part about learning to practice Reiki is how simple it is and how easy it is because all your life, you've worked hard to get anything or believed you should have worked harder for the thing that got away, you know, and, and in Reiki practice, the, the skill and the effort is really of self-restraint. Just place my hands. Now I'm practicing Reiki and now I'm not. Hands on, I'm practicing Reiki. Hands off, I'm not. If it's that simple in the foundation, then you won't get lost in your practice. And I love that then you can actually extend that to your life. Like you lost the subway. You just lost the subway. Don't add, right? Don't complicate it. Like I love, I think it was Sharon Salzberg. She shares a story of when they come back and someone had a pain in the arm and he was doing a big drama. And she was like, you only have a pain in the arm, right? So I think, as we learn, as you just said, like just placing my hands and not adding, we can also extend that to our life as an habit as well. Habit, habit, after all, with that word, sorry. <laughs> it's beautiful. Like, so I, again, I really appreciate how you can communicate very clearly. Again, my Scorpio side always likes to make like very big stories, but it's, it's funny, Reiki is simple. And I always call it deceptively simple because you can actually go very deep right through repetition just by placing your hands it doesn't mean it lacks depth as well you know i think the only way we can go deep is through repetition yeah sometimes clients will come and they'll say you know this is just like 
um, I'm with this old issue again, you know, and they're so disappointed in themselves that they haven't solved something. And I, and I try to help them appreciate, be grateful it's an old issue because if you kept having new issues, it would be <laughs> hopeless, you know, you'd be overwhelmed. We have these old habits and we keep revisiting them with new understanding and greater compassion and things melt a little bit, you know, and, and then we're doing better. And then something happens that takes us by surprise or frightens us. And we fall back into these very old habits a little bit. We usually don't fall so deeply, but what if we fell into new bad habits? Well, how would we ever get ourselves out from under the suffering if we always had to find a new plan, right? Oh, wow, I never looked at it that way. And now it's gonna be like, I, wow, that, that was very, I never thought about that. <laughs> it's so human. I mean, people putting themselves down because they still have these old issues yeah. <laughs> instead of like, Thank God I still have this. Well, I don't put myself down. I'm like, okay, I know how to handle this. I know the way I react and I soften into it. And, but I never thought about how lucky I am not to be in a different <laughs> issue. <laughs> and the That's simplicity of, like for me, the simplicity of the protocol that I use for my practice, which is just an eight placement protocol, creates a container for each practice that I can just drop into. You know, I can practice with absorption and abandon, not focusing, not concentrating, that's working too hard. But I place my hands and something in me says, okay, but now we're going home, yeah. 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 And it's funny because I know a lot of people go with intuition and, and I'm like, learn your protocol because if you want to get go worry, there are days when you have too much in your mind. It's so nice to just not think and be one with your body, like place your hands, be present and not have to feel anything. Just go back home. Just do it very simply, right? It's and yeah. I like teaching too. I'm like, I'm like, I may be like Ricky True, whether I love Ricky one simple protocol. I just love it. People who say they practice intuitively, in my experience, when I've when they've been willing for me to question them, there's nothing intuitive about it. They're thinking. They're they're engaged in a lot of stuff, and also they feel something, and then they think they have to move their hands there. Just because you feel something doesn't mean it needs any more attention. You, you know, because wherever we place our hands. It's not just that part of the body that responds. The, the initial response um, on a physical level certainly seems to be through uh, some combination of the nervous system, the endocrine system, and likely the endocannabinoid system. These are the three most subtle systems in the body and, and they're always you know, playing with each other. Very, very quick response among them. So once that is set in motion, that's everywhere in your body. Where is your nervous system not? You know, so if I place my hands on my chest, it's not just the nerves under my hand that are responding. It's my whole nervous system. You know, this down regulation from the stress response, the sympathetic response to the parasympathetic digest and heal response. And, and that involves everything. So you're going to feel things throughout your body, you know, as your body down regulates itself. We don't have to make that happen. We give our systems the invitation or the uh, necessary information and then let it respond in the way that is meaningful, appropriate, and doable in that moment. And that's something we can't possibly know or even intuit, but our bodies know. We know how to heal. 
So I, I think a big piece of, of Reiki practice and certainly Reiki soap practice is just getting our minds out of the way, what we think we know, you know, being a little, little humbler with what we think we know. I, I love that. And again, as you said, right, not go back into the thinking mind, which is where the issue started and you're not going to solve it there and not be distracted because also when we're not distracted by sensations, we're also a little bit more present and focused in day life. You know, it's also a good practice. Like, you know, like, yeah, their feelings, stay with your hands, stay with your heart, stay present. And, and the way you put it, it's so amazing because you also have the background of what's going on there. Like, you know, because sometimes I say to people like, I've done sessions where I have a hand on my heart for half an hour, right? And same reason, like, I don't need to worry if I'm present with my hands, it works, right? And maybe the issue is on my little toe. It doesn't really matter as long as we're present. Right, your body knows where your little toe is. <laughs> <laughs> Better than I do because I'm really good with facial movement. I'm learning after five years of martial arts, but Five years ago, I didn't know where my toe was placed. I can uh -huh. tell you that, but my body knows. So yes. So I, I want to thank you, Pamela, so much for this interview. And for myself, I learned a lot. And I'm sure everybody watching this is not going to only learn a lot, but also get some precious language that, you know, is very much needed. So I want to present to you a drawing. And it's going to be, when we do the book, it's going to be for you. And I hope you can see it. So, oh, how beautiful. Yeah, so it's basically the precepts incarnated is a Buddha scene, but I love this fact that they are the arrows of worry and anger, and then your practice and the space of compassion turns them into flowers of gratitude. So again, that's my self-expression creative self. That's the way I communicate my Reiki practice is basically visually. So that I... I basically was inspired by our like our talk last week. So thank you so much. And thank you. Really, um, thank you. And it's, it's a beautiful drawing and a beautiful conversation, Natalie. I always appreciate your presence and we'll do it again sometime. Perfect. And I'll, again, I'll add all the links to your website, your book, uh, to the global practice, and also for people as well to get the form and sign up for the regulation. And I hope one day we can go back to the spa days and the GCC. I'm really missing those in-person days as well, where we could place our hands on people. So it was beautiful. Wasn't it so amazing? I mean, Natalie, you know, I think the most people we ever had was 50, maybe 51, something like that. But people would come, practitioners who didn't know each other, who had different practices. And, you know, we would demonstrate, well, this is just how we practice here because everybody needs to be looking the same because it's a public event. Yes. People come back six months later, they, they need to have an experience, you know, that is predictable to them. And that's all that, that that's about. And then the community would come and, Many people, more often than not, people were having their first experience of Reiki practice. And they would walk into a room with eight beds, eight tables, and usually at least two practitioners at each table. And with such trust, you know, they would lie down, the lights were dim, and the practitioners would move through the placements in silence. And some of the practitioners were very experienced. One of them had been with me from the very beginning it, and it's been 13 or 14 years now. But also sometimes there'd be people who had just finished a first degree class. So it was a wonderful opportunity for people to practice on people they didn't know without having to talk about what they were doing and just get the practice experience, which builds their conviction in the practice, not only their confidence that, oh, I can do this, but their conviction that this practice is real and it's valuable and it's subtle because they could see even in the dim light at the end of the, the treatment, the person would open their eyes and you know, have this beatific look 
that their whole demeanor had changed so beautifully. And it made such a difference. I, I agree with you. I hope that we get to do it. And I just shared that to maybe inspire other people in other areas to start something like that in their community when we're able to safely be with one another again. I'll be there. And so that you know, I actually have a practice group every Tuesday at night. We met at your clinic and we practice in different cities every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Wonderful. So creating community as well, you know, it extends. So very, very grateful. And hopefully 2022 will be there. That would be lovely. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Pamela. And hopefully we'll chat soon. Take good care of yourself. You too. Thank you, Natalie. And thank you for all the good work you're doing to bring Reiki practice to so many people. Thank you. Ciao.